Welcome scholars again to yet another presentation in the series on history of the Christian church part one. The grace of the Lord be with us as we explore the history of that time. This presentation is meant to create a picture of how the Christian church ended by 590. Why do we want to create a picture of where the church ended by 590? This is because from 590, many church historians or historians of the Christian church uh, find 590 as the demarcation that separates ancient church history from medieval church history. They also find that what the church was by 590, the seeds the church had planted or the practices the church had embraced. The state in which the church was and the things the church had acquired and embraced were going to be the foundation or were going to be the issues that the future church during the medieval time will be dealing with. So this is more like a summary of what we've been covering so far. So we're going to just in different areas outline where the church was by 590. Remember, after 590, we will have the first bishop of Rome, Gregory the Great, lead the church into now a totally new path in which papacy or the Roman Catholic Church will take dominance of the entire history of the Mediterranean basin with the Baltic basin, Western Europe, as well as the Eastern part. Number one, by 590, the Bishop of Rome and Constantinople were left as the two most prominent clerical leaders. You would remember what we had said in 330, Constantine moved the emperor moved the empire's capital city over which he was emperor to Constantinople in the east. But simply because Rome, the capital city of the Roman Empire, was in Italy, the bishop of Rome emerged as a great leader in the west. But also the bishop or the patriarch of Constantinople under the new Rome also remained as a prominent church leader. That's how 590 ends. By 590, the practical union of the church and the state under Constantine and his successors led to the secularization of the church. The patriarch of Constantinople came under the control of the emperor and the Eastern Church became a department of the state. By the way, this has remained. The Church in the East, the Orthodox Church in the East, has not been out to stand on its own in the way the Western Church has stood, in this case, the Roman Catholic Church. Brief comments on this. You remember when the emperor moved to go to Constantinople, he was the emperor. And so the bishop had to work with him. This is different with the bishop of Rome where there was no more emperor at that time because the emperor had moved to Constantinople. So we would come to the understanding that um, the unity of the church and the state by 590 led to the secularization of the church. The veneration of angels, 
saints, relics, pictures, and statues was a logical outcome of the attempt to accommodate the barbarian converts who were used to such in their worship. Remember we covered this. The Christian church overwhelmed by the barbarians who got converted with their pagan practices attempted and accommodated some of their practices as a way of helping them in their worship. So you find relics, pictures, veneration of angels and saints, those things that were not part of the church have become part of the church. Connection with the monastic, with, with the monarchic state also led to a change from a simple democratic worship to a more aristocratic, colorful form of liturgy with a sharply drawn distinction between the clergy and the laity. Remember, in the state, things were done in order. It's the Romans, that's the culture. When the church had this connection with the state, they, as it were, emulated or exemplified what the state did. The state had a distinction between the emperor and those they lead. So this practice of separation or distinction between clergy and laity came as a result of the connection with the monarchic state. It, it made the church lead its simple democratic worship to a more colorful, more form of liturgy that made a big distinction between the clergy and the laity. Sunday became one of the major days in the church calendar after Constantine decided that it was to be a day of civic as well as religious worship. That is how we end the 590 period. Sunday has now become a prominent day because it had been elevated to that after the Constantine had changed. Sacerdotalism, the belief that the substance of the ordinance is efficacious through the priestly celebrant, steadily gained ground. This resulted in the increased emphasis on the separation of the clergy and the laity. You know, the belief that developed that the substance, the bread of the ordinance did change and had a certain efficacy in it, it had become the actual body of Christ or the actual blood of Christ, thereby making the priests be the ones who would administer it, had gained grounds to the extent that because the clergy administered it to the laity, the laity were now looked upon as down or as different, but not on the equal plane with the clergy. The veneration of Mary, the mother of Jesus, which was to lead to the adoption of the doctrine of her immaculate conception in 1854 and her miraculous assumption to heaven in 1950, developed rapidly by 590. Mary today, especially in the Catholic Church, if not exclusively in the Catholic Church, and in maybe to a certain extent in the Eastern side of the Church, has received a certain level of divinity by which prayers are offered through Mary to the point where by 1854, the doctrine of her immaculate conception and by 1950, her miraculous assumption to heaven were developed. Those had begun growing and had found roots by 590. The veneration of saints came as a substitute to hero's worship, which the pagans were used to, giving these saints venerated some 
semi-divine honors. You know, the barbarian converts who came into the church, including the Roman pagan worshippers, they were used to, to doing things such as the veneration of saints. And when at the time of their con conversion, they were, they were used to the veneration of heroes. That's the heroes, different kind of heroes within their activities. That practice when they became church uh, believers in Christ, they substituted it for the veneration of saints. So you have now these venerated saints uh, who are pronounced a saint after they die, uh, some quickly, some after some time. There was an increased ceremonies that could be ranked as sacraments by 590, marriage, penance, ordination, baptism, including infant baptism, the Lord's Supper, had reached a certain level where these were becoming prominent sacraments. Now remember sacraments with the separation of laity and clergy was something administered by clergy. And therefore, because the laity could not perform those things, the clergy now gained a certain level of superiority or separation from the laity. The festival of Christmas became a regular practice about the middle of the fourth century with the adoption of the December date 25, that had been previously used by worshippers of Mithra. You know, there were pagan, pagan gods who in history are credited to have been born on December 25. And those pagan gods, because they were gods, the pagan worshippers were worshipping those gods on the date December 25, because those pagan gods were believed to have been born on 25th of December. Guess what? Christ Jesus was now associated to having been born December 25, and out was born Christmas, and it became a regular practice. There is no question in history, in other words, there is no question by historians that Christ Jesus was not born on December 25, the day we celebrate for Christmas. That is a day picked up because it was a day when pagan gods were born as is on the list and it came to now be attributed to Christ Jesus as having been born on that. By 590, this had taken root. Maybe it's interesting to read this now. The foundation of the medieval Roman Catholic Church that we are now about to enter, which is starting from 590 AD. We can safely say this. By 590, there arose a special, a special sacerdotal hierarchy under a dominant Roman bishop, the tendency to increase the number of sacraments and to make them the main avenues of grace and the movement to be an elaborate of a very high confiscated liturgy. That's the church we end with. That's where the church is in 590. Why do we learn history? It's not to know facts, it's to apply. Let me apply one lesson, scholars. What we do today plants the seed of what we will harvest tomorrow. The things we start sometimes thinking are small today can become the forest of tomorrow. When the church accommodated little by little the pagan practices of the pagan background converts or the barbarians, little did they know that the church itself 
was being converted into paganism. Now that's too strong, but I hope you get the message. When the Bishop of Rome ended after all those activities, now will emerge into the papacy system. You can know the background to it. Here is how I would close. We are where we are because of what was in the past. And what we do today are the seeds of what the church of tomorrow will be like. May the Lord bless you. And our next presentation now is the beginning of the medieval history of the church.